Call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Mayor Rankin? Here. Vice Mayor Walter? Here. Councilmember Ward? Here. Councilmember Hawkins? Here. Councilmember Glean? Here. Councilmember Anderson? Councilmember Anderson? Here. Councilmember Wall? Here. We have a quorum. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll stand for a moment of silence. Uh, keep in mind all the troops that are fighting overseas for our freedom. Keep them in mind tonight, and we'll go into the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This is the first call of the public for public comment on issues within the jurisdiction of the town council. Council rules limit public comment to three minutes. Individual council members may respond to criticism made by those commenting, may ask staff to review a matter raised, or may ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. However, members of the council shall not discuss or take action on any matter during an open call of the public unless the matters are properly noticed for discussion. In the back, there are sign-up sheets for those that wish to talk. I will give anybody else an opportunity afterwards. First, we're going to have Doug Stinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Doug Stinson. I'm here representing Pinal County Mounted Posse. Um, two aspects tonight. I wanted to get one, give you an update on the rodeo grounds. Uh, last time we talked to you, we let you know that it was doing some maintenance and we're doing some upgrades in the water system. That work has begun, um, and I'll make a public thank you to Jack Moore and Cooley Pump and Engine, along with the electrician, uh, True True Value, as well as the town itself, because Public Works is the one that actually formed and poured the concrete slab the water tank's sitting on. Um, so we're getting that done. Everything's looking good for the Junior Parada. And the other thing I'd like to do, I was hoping our new royalty coordinator would be here um, Katie, but she's not here tonight. Um, so if the council would allow, I'd like to introduce the 2016-2017 Junior Product Queen for this year, Janae. Jenny, go ahead and just tell them about yourself a little bit. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Madam Vice Mayor and members of the council. I am very honored to be your 2016-2017 Florence Junior Prada Rodeo Queen and I'm very excited to see what it has in store for me and everybody else. I'm very excited to run in the Prada this year, and I hope to do a very good job and make you guys very proud. Thank you. Okay, now one thing you let, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> now you gotta get back up there and mic. Do you mind telling us your name? <laughs> My name is Jenny Martinez. And where do you live, Jenny? I live in Queen Creek. Oh, all right. Thank you very much, and you're a very pretty young lady, and do us proud. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Mr. Mayor, thank you uh, for the opportunity to introduce her. The other thing I would like to say about her is she's not only the queen, she's been a participant at the Junior Product for the last several years, so she rodeos as well. Um, you went, Katie did just walk in, so. Katie, did Katie got a few things she'd like to say? Sure. All right. Katie's the new royalty coordinator starting this year. Okay. I am very excited to be part of this group and this part of the town. Um, I've been a rodeo queen for three years and hoping to run for Miss Rodeo Arizona this next year as well. So I'm looking forward to bring 
a lot to this rodeo and then also this town. Um, I've been able to, Haley George, the queen from last year, I actually got her to participate in the rodeo and then become their queen. Um, so it's, it's been quite a fantastic group to be part of the Pinal County Mounted Posse and then to be also part of the town of Florence. Well, great. We're glad to hear, hear that. <laughs> You're going to run for Miss Rodeo Queen? Yes, Miss Rodeo Arizona. That's correct. Okay. And where will that be held at? That will be held in Payson in August. Okay. Well, that's a good time for everybody to go up in August to get out yeah. of the heat. <laughs> well, congratulations, and wish you the best on it, and take care of our young queen. Thank you. Okay, Steve. Steven? Where are you at? You're next, bud. Well, my name is Steve Smallage, folks, and I represent the Happy Adobe. Uh, my wife is not here, so I'll speak for her. I'm here on uh, a worrisome part of what's going on on the Circle K. Uh, I am a business owner in town. I'm also a resident in town. Um, I wish that the council and our body, um, mayors, and, and, and whatever might be involved in trying to find out on these Circle Ks, before you go ahead and grant all these variances that they want, try to find out from them if they are going to lease those buildings, in what criteria they're going to fall in, are they going to try and ask two or $3,000 a month out of these buildings so they're non-leasable? Um, try to find out if their intent before you vote on this measure to grant them these leniences on the properties that you're trying to do, if they intend to make it look like the one in Coolidge, which at the present time is totally boarded up and a fence around it. I understand that the newspaper has said that the Circle K is a four-year lease, and that one that I'm talking about enjoins my property. My concern is that I don't want to see a boarded up Circle K or a fenced in piece of property or a derelict property beside mine. I try really hard to keep it clean. I try to do the best for the town that I can. And I expect other businesses, including them, to do so. Um, and I think it would be just a shame to pass anything that they want to grant them that property without the town having the ability to lock them down and say, what are you going to do for this town? Are you going to assure that these buildings, you actually even have the ability to lease them? Because lots of times you can't sublease. And I understand the one that is beside me, to the north side of me, is a leased building. They do not own it. So can they sublease it out? Uh, if they can't sublease it out and they got another four-year lease, it's going to set that vacant. I wish the, the council and the town would have the spokesman, the representative for the Circle K to address these problems um, just simply because I'm not against the Circle K expanding over there. I mean, you know, business is business. I think it would be good for the town. It would probably make a greater appearance. Too. But the, the part that comes down it is the money worth them moving to one building and leaving us with two derelict buildings. We have enough issues in this town with buildings that can't seem to get renovated for one reason or another. Um, and I'm one of those. <laughs> um, and I just think that we really need to, because once you do this, it's too late. We can't say, no, you can't put up a fenced in yard in front of there. No, you can't put plywood up. We're done. So whatever, they, whatever the town does before you give these variances for them to move the building to make sure they have enough so they can stay away from the church next door, I, I think you really need to consider addressing these problems personally in maybe closed sessions with our mayor, with our um, managers and stuff, and try to find out exactly what their direct intent is because you are dealing with a corporation. You're not dealing with an individual with me. I can stand up and tell you, and I'm going to promise you I'll do something, and I will do my out best to do it. But you're dealing with a corporation, and they are going to do whatever they have to do to generate the most amount of money for their pocket. And I just hope that you all will 
think very harshly before you make this consideration to give these variances and stuff to them so they can just come in and, and leave us in a very poor position. And the other thing, uh, probably more than three minutes, but anyway, um, I would like to have some type of help from the town because if they, if they get the property next door to me, if they bring in equipment and park it on the road frontage where I am, or they put in fire hydrants on my street, or do in, that leaves me with no parking. And I would like to see the town try to talk to them or whatever, if you can, to make sure that any of their construction business stays on the other two streets, the back street, the highway off of the main road out there or, or over towards the ice house where there's no businesses, where there's no residential on that side. Um, I don't really think my neighbor is going to appreciate all the banging and beating either, but it is going to get done. But what, what don't, we don't want is dump trucks and cement mixers and stuff parking on the parking area because I am limited. I am truly limited. They park two trucks over there. My business is done for the day. I mean, I just had to ask some of the guys over there the other day when they was doing some work over there out front putting in the asphalt, please park down the other end because I'm open, I'm there for business, I need to generate business, you know, and, and thankfully they moved on. But I, I would hope that the town would try to keep that into consideration too. And I appreciate it very much for the council hearing me. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Any other member of the audience have anything they'd like to say? Seeing no movement, we'll close call to the public. Proclamation. National HOSA Week. Whereas HOSA Future Health Professionals is a career and technical student-oriented organization for high school and post-secondary students who plan to pursue a health career, and whereas HOSA serves as a pipeline of future health professionals, and whereas HOSA provides a strong foundation for preparing tomorrow's healthcare professionals through skill development, leadership opportunities, and community service, and whereas health science education and HOSA support and encourage students whose interests lie in pursuing a health career, thereby helping to alleviate national shortage of health workers, and whereas HOSA promotes the development of responsible citizenship, personal integrity, and compassion for hum in humanity. Now, therefore, it be resolved that Tom J. Rankin, mayor of the town of Florence, Arizona, proclaimed November 6th through the 12th, 2016, as National HOSA Week. All right, Brent, thank you very much. Tonight we have with us Jamie Greer. I got your name right, right? Yes. And you're a member of Cabot over in Coolidge. Now, do you, where do you go to school at? Uh, my home school? Yeah. I go to Post and Butte. Post and Butte. A lot of kids from in the Cabot are from Florence and Post and Butte, as well as Coolidge. The opportunity you're getting out there exceeds a lot of kids, what they get in just regular normal high school. You're beginning a career field. You've chosen a career field to go to, and we just hope that you continue on with it. And on behalf of my town council and myself, it's proud to proclaim this week for you guys. And we just want you to succeed. We want you to be good. And we want you to come back one of these days when we have our, another hospital here in Knoll Town that uh, you might go to work there, okay? And uh, you got a, something you want to say, I know that. If you, and here you go. All right, thank you. All righty. Good evening, Mayor Rankin and all the city council members. My name is Jamie Greer and I'm a second year student at Cavett and I'm in the medical assisting program. I'm also a full-time student at Post and Butte. Cavett has eight, career, eight different career and technical education programs and we serve students from all over Pinal County. All of our programs offer free dual enrollment college credits, licensure opportunities, or both. Students attend Cavett for two years and we're bused back and forth to our home schools. Sorry, I talk fast. <laughs> We're very proud that we're involved in, in many, many real life activities such as we, we run clinics and we also participate in business and industry for job shadowing and internships. Tonight we're here to discuss HOSA, which is our first professional organization and it's specifically for allied health students. 
I'm a chapter officer for HOSA, so I had training this past summer, and we also have created a program of work, which is also called a strategic strategy, or a strategic plan, and and I help, and I help, and I have to assist in running monthly meetings, just like you, just like you all, just like you all do here. Besides learning these leadership skills, our members can also compete in competitions. As in, we have a we have a spring conference in Tucson, and we they also have a, a have the potential at, at competing at our national level, which is held in Orlando, Florida this year. It is National HOSA Week, November 6th, no, November 6th through 12th of 2016, and we are asking for, we are asking of all of, all of our participating cities to make a proclamation for it, which you have, and thank you so much for allowing, allowing us to address the, you this evening. Jamie, thank you very much, and I know speaking in public, uh, I still have trouble. I get embarrassed. Yeah. But you will be okay. You're doing great. And just keep it up. Like I said, continue with your career. And we're mighty, mighty proud of you. And I'm proud to be able to name this week for you all. So take the proclamation with you. Take your notes here that you're reading from. <laughs> and tell, uh, tell, your, tell your teacher over there that I'm not a bad guy. I promise he's not a bad guy, Ms. Martinez. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Michelle. Jamie, again, on behalf of the town council and myself, thank you very much, and Godspeed and good luck to you, honey. Thank okay, you. let's give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. Next, we have a presentation by Ken Hall, the executive director of CAG. I'm just waiting on the mayor. I heard him back there. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rankin and members of the town council. My name is Ken Hall, and I am the executive director of the Central Arizona Governments. And I basically wanted to come before you this evening to give you maybe a five the seven-minute overview of CAG, or the Central Arizona Governments. I prepared a, a slide presentation and also um, provided handouts prior to the meeting, so you should have a copy of the presentation and also a, sh a map and some cards. Uh, basically, CAG, or the Central Arizona Governments, is a council of governments and we were signed into existence in 1970 by then Governor Jack Williams under Executive Order 70-2. Basically what Executive Order 70-2 did is uh, divide the state of Arizona into six distinctive regional councils of governments. I have a, I prepared a map here I think you can kind of see it but you also have a copy of it up up there as well. Um, there are two, of the six councils of governments, there are two urban councils of governments, uh, one being the Maricopa Association of, uh, of Governments, uh, located in Phoenix, which serves metropolitan Phoenix and Maricopa County, of which the town of Florence is also a member. And then there's also the Pima Association of Governments in Tucson, which provides service to the Pima uh, County area. And then there are four rural COGS, um, the Northern Arizona Council of Governments, which is NACOG, which is comprised of Yavapai, Coconino, Navajo, and Apache counties. Then there's the Western Arizona Council of Governments, or WACOG, which is comprised of La Paz, Mojave, and Yuma counties. And then there's the Southeastern Arizona Governments Organization to the southeast of us, which is comprised of Santa Cruz, Cochise, Graham, and uh, Greenlee counties. And then there's us. Uh, the, the Central Arizona Governments, 
which is comprised of Gila and Pinal counties, of which the town of Florence is also a member. There are 23 member governments that belong to um, our organization, our agency, the Central Arizona Governments. And basically this consists, our member uh, governments consist of 11 municipalities of Pinal County, which is, are essentially Apache Junction, Casa Grande, Coolidge, Eloy, Florence, Kearney, Mammoth, Marana, Maricopa, Queen Creek, and Superior, and also six municipalities in Gila County, as well as both Gila and Pinal County governments. And we also uh, consist of four Native American uh, communities, the Akchin, Gila River, uh, White Mountain Apache, and San Carlos Apache uh, tribes. Uh, from a regional government's governance perspective, in terms of how we are set up, uh, we have three technical advisory committees, uh, which are the, the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, uh, the Environmental Planning Committee, and the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy Committee, or the SEDS. Uh, the recommendations from these particular committees are forwarded to our management committee, the CAG Management Committee, which is comprised of city and town managers, uh, town clerks, tribal managers, are their appointees. Um, basically, the management committee functions as the advisory committee to the regional council. And all the recommendations from the management committee, along with any regional governance issues and any internal issues uh, to our agency, uh, CAG as a whole, are then forwarded to our CAG regional council. Now, our CAG Regional Council is our governing body, uh, which consists of mayors, county supervisor, county supervisors, uh, tribal governors, are their appointees. And they set our policies, they make decisions, and they govern CAG as a whole. Uh, typically, our agency committees, our technical advisory committees, meet on a monthly, bi-monthly, and quarterly basis and in accordance with our bylaws, the CAG Management Committee and the CAG Regional Council meet a total of six times a year. The next slide identifies the representatives um, from the town of Florence to our agency, the CAG. Uh, Mayor Tom Rankin currently serves on the CAG Regional Council. Uh, Mr. Jess Knudsen, who's over here, um, the Assistant Town Manager, serves upon our CAG Management Committee. Uh, Mr. Uh, Christopher Salaz, or Salas is the Public Works Director and he serves on our Environmental Planning Committee. And Ms. Jennifer Evans, the uh, uh, Town Management Analyst, also serves on the K Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy Committee. In terms of our departments, uh, through ADOT we carry out a number of transportation planning activities. We administer community development block grants. We receive a, uh, an annual non-entitlement amount from the Arizona Department of Housing of about $2.2 million, and we distribute that money uh, throughout our region. Uh, through the uh, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, we carry out regional environmental planning and 208 water quality planning activities. And we also carry out a number of economic development planning functions. Uh, we have a pretty sophisticated information services department and that um, provides socioeconomic data and maintains a, a variety of regional databases and provides GIS mapping, our geographic information systems mapping to our communities that are in need of mapping services. Uh, we created a community development uh, planning department for communities in need of our planning services. And under contract to Pinal County, we also implement the uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or which is known as WIOA. Um, but this has been rebranded as Arizona at Work. If you're out and about and you see Pinal County, Arizona at Work, um, we administer the adult and dislocated worker programs associated with that, uh, the, uh, with the WIOA. Uh, in addition to these functions, these departmental functions, um, we are also a federal economic development district under the U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration. Uh, that means that we're eligible to go after economic development grants 
and assistance for public works and planning projects. Also, um, by statute, we are the office of the Pinal Regional Transportation Authority. Uh, the RTA was placed together for the purpose of creating over $600 million in roadway and transit improvements in Pinal County over the next 20 years. And I would just like to let the council know uh, that Mr. Um, Mayor Rankin currently serves as the chairperson uh, to the Pinal RTA, and we've certainly appreciated his leadership throughout this process. Another, um, this next slide, there, I have a picture of, of two different um, documents, and you should have received both of these documents already. One is entitled um, Central Arizona Government's Regional Overview, Fiscal Year 2017. This is basically uh, an overview of CAG as an agency. Uh, if you go through it, it, it provides a little bit of our history, uh, an overview of our agency and the region, uh, the function of CAG, and in the middle there is a listing of each one of our, um, our members. And we also go through information on the CAG departments and functions in each department. We have a staff directory and a section on regional governance. It's a, it's a good uh, overview of the central Arizona governments as an agency. And while I'm going out to the cities and towns, another document that we put together, it's a smaller brochure, it's called um, Scope of Services. And basically this identifies uh, certain activities that we can provide assistance uh, to our cities and towns uh, with. And if you look at the inside of the document, they're broken into uh, grant writing assistance, uh, assistance with surveys, an array of different community development activities, transportation planning, economic development, um, GIS mapping, our geographic information systems, and uh, information assistance, meeting facilitation, and a number of other items that are listed below that. But these are the two handouts I had for the council. Uh, in summary, um, I just wanted to state that not only are we a, a regional governmental alliance, but we're also here to assist our cities and towns. We are your council of governments. And, uh, if there is any way possible that we can assist the town with anything, you know, feel free to give us a call. I've left my card. Call, call me at any time. If you need us to come out for anything, uh, give us a call, and uh, we'll always respond and, and we'll help out in any way possible that we can. Um, so I would like to stress that please contact us if you need us for anything. Um, I have some, uh, the next slide is a contact, if you need contact information, and our web page, our website rather, is www.cagaz.org, and with that, I'd be more than willing to answer any questions that you may have. Do you remember the council have any questions for Ken, John? I have, a, I have a loaded question. I see he has ADEQ yes. on your things that you have contact with. That is correct. We are having a problem with ADEQ with our water supply, and we can't get their attention to uh, protect our water, our drinking water. How do we, uh, how do we get help on that? If you um, call us, we will get in touch with them, and we will do everything we can to set up a meeting. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. John, uh, just for your information, I think it was two or three years ago, CAG passed a resolution in support of Florence and our endeavors on that, on that issue. Well, I think we need to remind them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. On their November 9th meeting, I don't know if this would be an opportunity to bring it up, they also have the status of the 2016 CAG Section 208 Water Quality Management Plan. If he attended one of those meetings, could he also bring that up at that time? Uh, I certainly could. Thank you. That is correct. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, Ken, thank you much. I've uh, been on to you about coming down here and letting the council know exactly what CAG does. Uh, if you have a lot of questions about CAG and you can't get a hold of Ken, you can always get with Brent or Jess. 
some of you may not know it, but Brent worked for, at that time, CAG, C-A-A, was C-A-A-G. Yeah, two A's, uh, for numerous years. So he's a wealth of information on CAG and uh, an asset to, to our community by having him there with, associating with CAG. Ken, thank you very much again. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Item C, presentation and acceptance of the 2016 award from the Arizona chapter of the American Planning Association in the category of best distinguished historic plan, program, or landmark for the Reese Home Rehabilitation Project. Mark. Mayor and Council, this particular item, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and turn it over to our senior planner, Gilbert Elgin. And there's a few more people in the audience I know that will want to come up and share in this moment. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, let uh, Gilbert take over. Thank you. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, good evening. Um, before we get started, I wanted to bring up a few people to help uh, present this to the council. Are any points? Alton Bruce? Skip, if you want to stand up and be recognized. Skip Chase. Okay. So, I, before we start, I would like to introduce uh, a town resident. Her name is uh, Teresa Reese, um, also known by Teddy. Uh, she's the owner of this property here in front of you. Um, it is called the uh, Jenny Lopez Residence. Um, it's the property that was transformed, and uh, it's the one that won the award for the town. Um, I want to make it very clear that the, uh, the former town, uh, town grants coordinator, uh, Ernie Felice, was the one that started this project, and he allowed, he allowed the rest of us to kind of tag along. Thank you for that, Ernie. Um, this property that we have here in front of you in the image, um, it was built in 1914. Um, on March 25th, uh, 2015, the Historic District Advisory Commission had approved a design review application um, to rehab this property completely. But uh, due to the high cost of uh, re rehabbing this property, um, the project almost never went forward. Um, it was too expensive. However, um, those of us who were involved, we came up with a solution to, the, to this issue. It's there in front of you. We, had, um, we were able to come up with the idea of taking the historic property, which is on this side here, and extending it, giving it an extension. This here is a three bedroom, two bath home that was added onto the property to make it one piece. Um, as you see in front of you, it was given uh, small features that make it blend into the existing historic property. So the three items that were, that were approved, uh, actually I should say that were accomplished, was that uh, we removed a blighted home from the area with this property here in front of you. Uh, we preserved this property for um, further re rehabbing in the future. And we also improved uh, the living conditions for a town citizen. Now I'm going to give the uh, chance for the other guys that were involved uh, to speak if they'd like. Thank you, Mr. Olguin. You may have heard before I came to work for the town of Florence that I was involved in a little uh, rehabilitation project on Pinal Street. And uh, I just want you to know that um, the pride I had for being involved in this project, for being so fortunate and very lucky to have been a part of this project, the Reese House, exceeds what happened at, uh, at Pinal County. And there were so many people involved. This was, a, this was a perfect project. You had an elderly widow who had raised her family here in a historic home in downtown Florence and was living on Social Security and didn't have the means to, um, to improve her, her house and was living basically without any heat or electricity, plumbing failing, and, and the, you have the, the Bruces who have uh, done rehabilitation for so many years. 
that were fortunately available to, to help with the project. Arizona Department of Housing provided the grant funding. The historic district stepped forward and said, let's do this. Planning and development with Mark and Gilbert. There were so many people that were a part of this, and I was so very lucky uh, and fortunate to be, to, to be involved in the project. I'm a Florence guy. How lucky can I be to have been involved in two important projects like this that were recognized uh, statewide? So thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. I just want to say thank you to the town uh, council for allowing Rosa and I to, to be involved. We've been deeply committed to housing rehab in, in Pinal County for 30 plus years, and it was a pleasure to work on a project like this. I just want to encourage you to keep looking for funding to do more housing here because there's a lot more that we can do. Uh, it helps houses, it helps families, it helps neighborhoods, and it pays my insurance bill. So. <laughs> I also wanted to mention that uh, we have in the audience behind us, we have uh, Skip Chase. Uh, he's the owner of the Taco Bell here in Florence, and he, he was gracious enough to donate money to have the, um, the historic portion of the property painted, um, this portion here, so it would match. Not only did he have it painted, but it also um, replaced fascia, um, it did some minor repair to, to the property, made it uh, uh, weatherproof. So he's here. Did you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to give you a little check. <laughs> it was a great project. He got me involved in it. Gilbert got me in there when I was down at the town hall the one day working on it. And I'm just happy it worked out as well as it did. And congratulations to everybody. Thank you. So thank you all. Um, like I said, it was a group effort. Appreciate having the chance to work on this. This is the actual home itself, the portion, that, the brand new portion that was built. And here's the, uh, the, the article from the paper. So now I would like to um, present this award to the town. Now I see why you put it all down. <laughs> the, uh, on behalf of the town council, myself, it's an honor to accept this project, the award that you put into it for the town to get it. I've known Teddy a long time. She know me all my life. A neat lady, a deserving lady that uh, couldn't do it. And it couldn't have got done if it went for the co cooperation of everybody involved from the Historical Society. And I hate to say anything good about Alton, but I have to. <laughs> he was associated with Coolidge too long. <clears throat> when your company came in and you painted the building to make it match, it really did a good lot for that area. It really, really did. We want to thank you very much. Thank the Taco Bell, or I know you're not Taco Bell, but you own it, and we appreciate that. And you're coming into our community and helping like that. Maybe more people will get involved in the future projects that we have. And Ernie, what can I say about you? <laughs> I'm thinking, but it's all, but seriously, you put your heart and soul into projects when you get them started, and you'd like to see them finished, and I've seen that with the courthouse, the job you did over there working with them. I've seen it with this project here. Even though you've left us and went over kind of west of here to Casa Grande, I know your roots are still here in Florence, and they always will be, because you've got too many relatives who won't let you forget it. But again, on behalf of the town council, myself, all the citizens of Florence, thank you very much for everything that you guys have done. I really appreciate it. And this ward just proves that when we all work together, things work right. And I appreciate it very, very much. And the whole council does too. Okay? Thank you. Wait a minute. Wait. Mark wants a picture.
Item D, presentation by Ashley Shawarski, Utility Service Partners Incorporated regarding service line warranties. Uh, Ashley and I have worked together previously. Uh, she is talking to you about a program that's sponsored by the National League of Cities uh, that a number of communities utilize in Arizona. And we thought, uh, I ran into her at the League Conference, and we thought it would be a good idea to uh, present what they do to the Council for your consideration. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you all for having me here this evening. Um, as Brent said, my name is Ashley Shaworski, and I represent the National League of Cities Service Line Program. Our service line program is the only one that is endorsed by the National League of Cities, as well as here in Arizona by the League of Arizona Cities and Towns as well. Um, the company, though, that I actually work for is called Utility Service Partners, and we administer the program. And we are a Better Business Bureau business with an A-plus rating, as well as we did win the Torch Award for Marketplace Ethics from the Better Business Bureau. So that is something that we are very proud of and are always striving to maintain that high level of ethical standards while conducting business. But what our program really helps to do is address the public policy issue of our aging infrastructure. We know that communities all across the United States really are doing their part to either upgrade or maintain their public infrastructure, but the homeowners portion of these lines were kind of being forgotten about. So that's actually why the National League of Cities went out and did research. They wanted to make a program like ours readily and easily available to cities and towns all across the United States. So they went out, did the research on your behalf, and we were the company that they did choose to provide that program. So what we do is we partner with um, communities in order to make our completely voluntary program available to your residents. And we provide homeowners with optional protection on their external water lines, external sewer lines, as well as in-home plumbing. And we provide our services with a complete turnkey approach for the town, where we handle all of the aspects of the program, the marketing, billing, claims management, and customer service. And there is absolutely no cost um, for the town if you choose to participate in the program, and the town would actually receive an incremental revenue stream for their participation as well. What I find to be the biggest ben benefit of our program is that it really just helps to raise awareness. Pretty much every um, town that I speak with, I'll hear the same type of thing, that if a resident does have some sort of issue with one of their external lines, um, their, call, their first call is typically to someone at the town. And then you all go out only to find that it's on the resident's portion of that line. And then the homeowner is left to find a reputable contractor and foot this large bill that they either thought may be covered by their homeowner's insurance or by the town, um, which we obviously know that neither of that is the case. So I kind of think of our program as a free public awareness campaign because all of the residents within the community would receive a letter in the mail. And the beginning of the letter really is just educational. It lets homeowners know that this is something that they are responsible for and lets them know that the town has partnered with us in order to introduce this voluntary program. So even if someone chooses not to enroll in our program, at least they are well aware that this is something that they are responsible for and that the town tried to take a uh, proactive approach at educating them of this. Also, it really can give your residents peace of mind because they know for just a few dollars a month, um, they can choose to transfer the risk of these lines onto us, a reputable company that is not only endorsed by the National League of Cities, but also the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. And if they were to have an issue, all they have to do is make one phone call to us, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we would actually dispatch a local licensed plumber or contractor to do the, to do the repair. Um, so that's another huge benefit of our program is that we only use local area contractors for all of our work. And we do that for many reasons, but mainly we want to keep as much money here within your local economy as possible, as well as your local contractors would be familiar with the town's local code and make sure to do the work up to your standards, which includes getting all of the proper permits for the work as well. And once we partner with a community, um, what we actually begin to do is develop a contractor network that would service the claims for the town of Florence. And we really let you be as much or in little, little involved in that selection as you would like. Some of our current partners have provided us a list of um, contractors that they want us to reach out to. Others want to stay out of it as much as possible. 
either works for us, but with all of our contractors, we go through a detailed vetting process where we make sure that they are licensed, have the proper amount of insurance, don't have open complaints with the Better Business Bureau, as well as we conduct background checks in drug screenings. Um, we just really want to make sure that it's someone that your homeowners are comfortable with coming to their home as well as potentially inside of their home. As for our coverage, we offer three completely separate programs. Um, we offer the external water line coverage, external sewer line coverage, as well as the in-home plumbing. Uh, the two external products are set up very similarly where we begin to cover those lines wherever they become the resident's responsibility all the way to where they would daylight inside of the home. So if a resident were to have an issue, whether it was a broken, cracked, leaking pipe, a tree root issue, um, a clog that just needs cleared out, anything that would impede the flow of those lines, they give us a call, we send out one of those local um, area contractors, and what the homeowner receives for their coverage is up to $4,000 towards each and every repair incident. So this is one of the many things that greatly separate us from other companies out there, is that ours is always on a per incident basis. So we do not have an annual or a lifetime limit, as well as we do not limit the number of incidents or claims that someone can have in a calendar year. So again, the homeowner does receive up to that $4,000 towards each repair incident, but if the repair was also needed in the public street, they receive up to an additional $4,000 um, towards public street repair and up to an additional $500 for public sidewalk repair. And again, that's always on a per incident basis. And we also do not have any type of annual, I mean, um, deductible or service fee. We did not want um, you know, a $50 or $100 service fee to deter someone from actually giving us a call and getting their issue taken care of. As for our third program, it's the in-home plumbing. And this was actually kind of developed by request of our current um, municipal partners. It kind of was the missing piece of the puzzle. And this would cover any water, sewer, or drain lines that are actually in the home after the point of entry that either may be broken or leaking. Um, it also includes any lines that could be embedded under a slab or a basement floor and the repair of clogged toilets. Um, and that's very similar where there's no service fee or deductible, no annual or lifetime limit, no limit on number of claims. And for the in-home, the resident receives up to $3,000 towards each and every repair incident. And we really do notice when a homeowner chooses to enroll in our program, they typically are a little bit more proactive about getting their issue taken care of because they know the cost of that repair isn't coming out of their own pocket. Um, as for another feature of our program is the revenue stream for the town. What the town actually receives in return for their partnership with us is 50 cents per month per paid warranty contract. So essentially if a homeowner chose to enroll in all three products, the water, sewer, and in-home plumbing, then the town could receive up to $1.50 per month per household, and that is paid to in the form of a royalty every January. Um, Obviously, our um, current partners can do anything that they would like with that revenue stream, but most commonly, they have set up funds to help low-income residents that may be having trouble paying a utility bill from month to month or to go to some type of social services um, program. I know the big thing everyone always wants to know is how we market our program. So we only ever market by direct mail, so you never have to worry about us calling, door-to-door, -door, anything like that. We typically have three mail campaigns per year. And the reason why we do have three mail campaigns is because we offer three products. Each mail campaign is geared towards one specific product at a time. And the reason why we do that is to limit any type of confusion. We want homeowners to be well aware that these are separate products. They do not have to choose any of them or any combination of them. So each letter is geared towards one product at a time. But that does not deter a homeowner from giving us a call or going to our website and choosing whichever product that they would like at any time. Um, also, we would never send anything out to your residents um, unless we had your review and approval prior. So before each and every campaign, we send a copy of our marketing letter over to you for that review and approval. And if we did not receive the approval, we would never mail to your residents for that campaign. We really want you to have input on that message as well as know exactly what is going out to your residents. Um, our standard letter, it is very, uh, the beginning is educational, and then it goes on to let your residents know that the town has partnered with us in order to introduce this voluntary program. But it clearly states that we are a separate company providing this service, as well as it is completely voluntary for the homeowner. And if they want to enroll, all they have to do is return the bottom of the form directly to us, give us a call, or um, go to our website to enroll. 
And then really once we partner with the community, we try to be as transparent as possible where all of our um, municipal partners get access to an online partner portal and would give all of you here access to a lot of good real-time information. So at any time you can log on there and see the number of residents enrolled, the number of residents enrolled in each product, as well as um, the number of claims filed. But what I find most important is it gives you access to our customer satisfaction surveys. Um, so every resident within the town of Florence that would file a claim would receive a customer satisfaction survey and everyone that is returned, good, bad, or indifferent, is uploaded onto that portal. That way you can take a look at that at any time. And it really allows us um, to keep track of not only our internal customer service, but also of our local contractors. Since they are the face of our company and actually out there doing the work, we just really want to make sure that they're doing the work up to our standards as well as yours. And if there's any type of issue, we can work together to rectify that as quickly as possible. And to date, we are partnered with over um, 350 municipalities all across the United States. We have 16 um, different partners here in the state of Arizona, and they're all listed in that packet there for you, so I don't have to rattle them off to you. Um, and we actually have paid out over $2.5 million in claims just for Arizona residents over the last few years. And I know I've rambled on to you all for the last few minutes, so I'm sure you may have um, some specific questions for me. Does anybody have any questions for her? Thank you. Pretty well. Uh, Go ahead, Bill. Just one. Uh, I noticed reading through the information, it, it mentioned, and you mentioned it too, uh, you said if, if there's a leak under the slabs, you know, the, uh, a lot of these historic homes have uh, wooden floors with crawl spaces. You still do those too, right? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, we have a lot of that common in the northeast as well so okay yeah, no, but i just just you know because yep. i didn't see anything about you know wooden <laughs> floors okay actually where are you where are you located where is your office located at here in arizona so our offices aren't in arizona our headquarters is actually in pittsburgh pennsylvania um right outside of there that's where i live um but we work my area is actually arizona so i work closely with um, Ken from the league, as well as a lot of the Arizona partners as well. So. And are you getting good response here in Arizona from your program? Or? Um, our national average is about, a, after about two to three years, is a 20 to 25 percent response rate. I know we are very popular in the city of Phoenix, and just in Phoenix, we've paid out over a million dollars in claims just for Phoenix residents. So I know they've um, definitely been utilizing the program there. Well, you're not going to be like that affordable care insurance if people get signed up to it. It's not going to double or triple in prices, are you? No. Um, it's guaranteed that it won't change at least for one year, and also it will never go up more than 50 cents in a year. So. And is it affordable for for uh, for people may, uh, that could be on considered uh, low-income housing projects? Our pricing is it's five dollars and seventy-five cents a month for the water line coverage, um, seven seventy-five a month for the sewer line coverage, and six ninety-nine a month for the in-home plumbing. Um, if someone signs up and pays annually, um, it knocks. It's about five dollars per product discount if you pay, um, pay up front annually. But that never locks a homeowner into a year agreement. If they need to cancel at any time, they give us a call, go to our website, and we refund any premium they didn't use. So it's always month to month for the resident. And my wife's looking at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Any other questions from the council? Well, let me ask you this question. What do we have to do to get the town in support of this? Um, if mayor and council uh, want to come back, um, further with respect to a contract, uh, please let Lisa or I know and we'd be willing to get that on a future agenda. Well, <laughs> I think we should direct Brent to take a look at this, folks. If it's something that'll help the people out. Oh, it definitely sounds great to me. And with their record, I, I don't see any problem with it at all. No, I don't either. You're right, Bill. We'll get that on a future agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and when you go back to Pittsburgh or back there, put those warm clothes on. I know. And think about us out here. <laughs>
It actually has been pretty nice, so I can't complain, but I'll probably go home and it'll be nice and cold. Yeah. <laughs> Item E, update on the gain event. Councilmember Anderson. Thank you. Uh, uh, for those of you who do not know what gain is, gain is getting Arizona involved in neighborhoods. Uh, this, uh, in other states, is the Neighborhood Night Out program. Arizona chose not to have the program in July for obvious <laughs> reasons. <laughs> so uh, they changed the name. and. We do it in, in October now. But I'd like to thank all those people who attended the game and at the Anthem uh, Park side on Saturday, uh, October 22nd. And uh, this was the first time event. And it was well attended, not as much as we'd like to have had, but uh, including the softball attendees who were there. We had uh, probably over 100 people that came through that night. I'd like to thank uh, all the supporters who participated in the event. Uh, they were the, the, the Pinell County Sheriff Department, the Pinell County Rescue Team, the Pinell County Probation Department, <coughs> the Coolidge Police Department was there, the Arizona Department of Public Safety, the U.S. Border Patrol, and the Bikers Against uh, Child abuse, abuse. There were several town departments, departments participating, Parks and Recs, uh, Clint Austin, Melly Harmon, and John Dixon, uh, Coco's FTC uh, Entertainment uh, was the uh, sort of the highlight of the night. Uh, the kids danced and sang and had a good time. Uh, Coco uh, really put on a good show for us. The Florence Fire Department ladder number 42 with Captain Corey Pine. Engineer Craig uh, Felice and Firefighter Matt Adam Radney were there with the ladder truck. I uh, also want to thank the Public Works for providing the barbecue grill. Uh, I don't know who specifically did that, I, so I didn't get a name for that, Chris. But, uh, and of course, we want to thank uh, the sponsors, the, the, the Florence Police Department. Uh, Sergeant Scott Morris was the prime organizer, Officer Jeff uh, Palmer was, was his helper and, and also an organizer. Kevin uh, Mounts was there to assist. Uh, Deanna Husk was also there. She served the food. And uh, Mary Battle was a volunteer, and she sort of kept us all in line, as she, as she normally does. <laughs> but uh, these uh, people uh, you know, from the police department, they did the setup, the teardown, they cooked, they served food. Uh, they did a lot of behind the scene work, and uh, we just uh, want to thank them for all the stuff that they did. It was a good showing of our police department. It showed they are warm, friendly people. They are good ambassadors for our town. I also need to thank our chief cook, was Mayor Rankin, and uh, uh, Police Chief Dan Hughes and I were sort of the uh, uh, assistants there. But I uh, also want to thank uh, Pulte and the AAM management group for allowing us to have the uh, event on the property. This was, I said, this was the first time. It was quite a learning. Uh, we've been taking notes, so we expect next year we'll get better at, at this and we'll have more people involved. And just want to remind uh, all the downtown people that they're invited to come uptown to these events also. Mr. Mayor, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that next year when this is done, we need to advertise it a little bit more, get it out as much as we can on the Anthem portals and things like that. There was a lot of interesting uh, things that went on out there in uh, night vision that people don't know what they are, procedures by the Border Patrol on what they're doing out there in the desert, uh, search and rescue units from Pinal County that were there. And just to be able to talk to the police officers and firefighters and get to know them on a personal basis, again, bringing our community closer together. And uh, I, John, I, I don't know if I was a chief cook or not, but I know I, you know, we, of course, the reason I was thrown into it, somebody was late. Yes, we won't mention who that was. No, but uh, the next time the chief's late at some, oh, we're not going to mention the name. Uh, but uh, we did have a good time. Certainly did. 
Uh, a lot of people had good comments about it, but I think if we can have more people at that, it'll be just that much better. I know one agency didn't show up that was supposed to be there, but there must have been a conflict scheduling date. But uh, all the agencies were there. Uh, they put in the time to come. And they're, you know, so I was glad to see, you know, the Department of Public Safety, the Border Patrol, and Search and Rescue, of course, were my kind of favorites. And uh, just seeing that, some of the equipment, you know, back in the days, back in the 70s, when I was with the Sheriff's Office in Search and Rescue, uh, if you had a horse, you went. If they're up in the Superstition Mountains, you rode a horse into there and stuff like that. Now these guys have got this climbing gear and all of this stuff. I couldn't believe how those trucks are loaded down with, with survival gear and search and rescue equipment. It's really interesting. So next year, people need to come out and take a look at it. But John, you're right. Uh, it was a great event. One other thing, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to thank all the departments here in town because, uh, you know, even though I've called out names here tonight, we had uh, participation from a lot of people working in the background, and we don't recognize our town staff enough uh, you know, because they, they were all supporting us in this. You know, finance, paid bills, and, and you know, we have people in the background who just uh, answer phones and, and support us all the time that we don't recognize. And I just want to thank all the town staff and all the town employees for their participation. Well, those guys from Public Works that unloaded that grill and loaded it back up, <laughs> yeah. that'd be some pretty stout people unless you use a forklift or something with that grill. It's a heavy duty. But, Chris, make sure all your people know about over there that were involved in that. We really appreciate that. <laughs> Anything else, John? No, thank you. Okay, see if everybody there next year. Item 7, Consent Agenda. All items on the Consent Agenda will be handled by a single vote as part of the Consent Agenda unless a council member or member of the public objects to at the time the agenda item is called. Item A, Recommendation of Approval, Arizona Department of Liquor Licenses and Control on the Coolidge Florence Elks Lodge 2350 Special Event Liquor License Application for their Anthems Motown Performance Event to be held at Anthem Merrill Ranch Union Center on November 18, 2016. Item B, recommendation of approval to the Arizona Department of Liquor Licenses and Control for the Pinal County Historical Society event liquor license application for their Christmas party to be held at the Pinal County Historical Museum December 7, 2016. Item C, recommendation of approval to the Arizona Department of Liquor License and Control on American Legion No. 9 application for a temporary extension of premises patio permit for the New Year's Eve uh, block party for de December 31st, 2016 and January 1st, 2017. Item D, recommendation of approval of the Arizona Department of Liquor License and Control on Cocopelli Moon Saloon's appreciation, application, sorry, for a temporary extension of premises patio permit for the New Year's Eve block party for December 31st, 2016 and January 1st, 2017. Item E, recommendation of approval to the Arizona Department of Liquor Licenses and Control on the Pinal County Historical Society's special event liquor license application for their Tom Mix book signing event to be held at the Pinal County Historical Museum on January 27, 2017. Acceptance of public improvements for Anthem at Merrill Ranch, Spirit Loop 2. Item G, approval of the Pinal County Property Use Agreement for the use of a vacant lot located at 383 North Main Street for holiday decorations and special events. Item H, approval of the electrical district number two dusk to dawn lighting contract for installation of 11 LED street lights along a section of Diversion Dam Road in the amount not to exceed $16,329.12 and for street light energy and street light maintenance for the street lights at a cost of $271.08 per month. Item I, approval of a grant in aid agreement between the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Town of Florence on behalf of the Pinal County Historical Society for tribal gaming funds in the amount of $700. Item J, approval of the resignation of Deborah Hansen from the Arts and Culture Commission. Item K, approval of accepting a register of demands ending September 30th, 2016 in the amount of $1,855,261.06. Does any member of the council have anything they'd like taken off the consent agenda? I'd like to have item F taken off. Item F yes. is in Frank. F in Frank, yes, sir. Any other? 
Does any member of the audience have anything they'd like taken off the consent agenda? Seeing no movement, we need a motion. Make a motion. We accept the consent agenda as read with the exception of item F. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 7F. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I call for the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. John? Yes, uh, Chris, when I was looking at the documentation on the approval of the acceptance of this uh, Spirit Loop 2, uh, with all the things going on with uh, FEMA right now, I was just concerned, do we, do we need FEMA approval, or how do we make sure that these new areas are under flood control or not under flood control? This is an individual um, infrastructure improvement project. As far as the, the uh, partial acceptance of Spirit Loop, it's, a, it's a, again, a partial acceptance of that. And there's no FEMA ties with this. Okay, but do we do we get FEMA approval, or or does FEMA look look at these, or what? How do you know? How do we make sure that we don't get caught again with uh, you know a, a area being in a flood control? Complicated question. I, I want to kind of keep on topic. Uh, under Arizona state law, a transportation improvement does not necessarily have to go through a FEMA review. Typically, we do make sure that, again, there's no adverse change in water surface elevation when a road is, is being constructed. Um, this particular improvement is, is, again, not tied to that LOMAR. Okay. Thank you. I make a motion that we approve item F. A second. We have a motion second to approve item 7F. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I call for the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item eight, new business. Resolution number 1603-16, discussion approval, disapproval of a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, approving a town core infill incentive plan request related to the proposed development of a new downtown Circle K convenience store and gas station to be located on Pinal County Assessor Parcel 202-03-0580, also known as Case PZ16-56INF. Mark. Mayor, members of the council, uh, actually Mr. Smallage was referring to this particular case here tonight, so I apologize to him for um, the placement on, on, the, on the agenda, but we had lots of other business to conduct. And also, um, I know in the audience we have representatives from Circle K that are here and uh, prepared to address specific questions related to um, what Mr. Smallage brought up. But what we have here specifically is an infill incentive request related to the development of this site. And this is a property that we're all familiar with because at one point it served as the Foxworth uh, Lumber Trust, Trust Yard and then it was uh, along Main Street. And, you know, along came the recession and the company really, really struggled and, and that business closed down. For a while we had a feed store uh, that was operating out of, the, out of that building for a little while. And then they too uh, closed down. And now that building, the old Foxworth building, has been sitting there as kind of an eyesore for, for quite some time. Um, it is, uh, there's several buildings on the property it's essentially paved, the entire, the entire surface is paved, and there's a chain link fence, in some cases with barbed wire fencing around, around that property. So um, an existing sign on the site that's about 14, 15 foot, foot tall. So um, it certainly isn't the most uh, welcoming image that we, that we have on, on Main Street. So of course we appreciate uh, the concerns of, of potentially there being a couple of uh, additional small um, vacated stores on, on Main Street. But what Circle K would like to do is they have an interest in building a new store on this, on this property, uh, which you first became aware of when, we, uh, when the liquor license was presented to, to you, Mayor and Council. And one of the reasons that they actually had to configure the building on the site this way, uh, at the site of uh, Main and Brady, um, is because of the separation that they needed to maintain from the store to the church to the to the south. 
So that is why it does have that or orientation uh, that is perpendicular to, to Main Street. That was initially a, um, a concern to us, and we worked over a period of um, the last few months with Circle K extensively on addressing concerns related to how the site would work, how the site plan would work, the landscaping, the, the building elevations, and so forth. Our other concern was the, that although the building's not in the historic district, it is um, on the edge of the district, and we wanted to make sure that it was uh, of compatible architecture to fit into the, into the area. Um, this shows you that there's three existing buildings on the, on the site. Um, this, the main access is going to be from, from Main Street. It will flow, flow all the way through, though, for ease of, ease of circulation, and you can see the perpendicular orientation of the, of the building there. Uh, Mr. Smallage's property would be on the other side um, of, the, of the building on the Brady side. So he was referring to uh, when the building is under construction or when it's operational, will there be um, employees of the contracting firms or ultimately employees of the store that are parking on Brady Street? As you know, at that Happy Adobe location, there is not any on-site parking. Um, and so that Brady Street is utilized for that business and for some other uses in that, in that area. Um, as far as the building elevations, uh, the, this project did go through the Planning and Zoning Commission and they received unanimous approval of the design review application. Uh, they were pleased with the overall layout of the site, as I mentioned, the site plan and the building elevation. So, we actually uh, went through about three or four building elevations on this project. And at the beginning of this effort, we saw a Circle K that was constructed down um, on 7th Street in Phoenix uh, in a historic district as well. And it had the brick elevation on it. And so we, our response was to go to Circle K and say if we could get a building that also had these kinds of uh, features on it with the canopies and the, and the, and the brick veneer and we were able to work that out through them. So it is, it is quite, a, quite an attractive store. Now, now that we're back on this building here, which is uh, because of the 300 foot distance and because of the existing development on the site, and it's infill development, so it's, it's always a little bit more challenging dealing with a site like that. The other challenge is that along Collingwood, there are some smaller existing buildings that they are working with them to see if uh, maybe the site could be expanded down to Collingwood. But right now, uh, you know, that was a constraint on their site as well. And that would be the, the, the water and ice facility, the car wash, and then there's a small office building um, that I believe is vacated at the, at the moment. Uh, but there's a chance that perhaps the site plan could be expanded to go down to Collingwood, and then it would consume, the, the development could take the whole, the whole block there. But the areas of concern where they have requested some uh, deviations from our development codes, uh, Mayor and Council, would be on the setback on Brady Street, so mainly so they can set the building back far enough to meet their 300-foot separation. Um, and actually, as far as the setback is concerned, in the downtown, as you know, particularly in the historic district or anywhere that's owned in D.C., we actually have encouraged building setting closer to, to the roadway. So this, this type of building orientation being closer to the street uh, is completely compatible with, with the area. With the building being set a little bit closer to the street, they've asked for some leniency on the, on the landscaping as well, which would be corresponding to the reduced setback. There's an existing sign on the site that I mentioned that is about 14, 15 foot tall. Um, they would choose not to utilize that sign uh, because they would like to bring on a new sign that would have uh, that would look much more, much more compatible with the uh, site. And that would also carry on the brick veneer and it would have the, the digital reading in it. So instead of the existing sign of approximately the same height, they would like to have permission to have uh, this particular sign on the property. And the other deviation, the landscape, the other is, would be the walls. On these, there's a screen wall around the property, particularly on your east, on your east elevation. Adjacent, there is there is a residential land use to to the east, and so 
along the parking there that would front along the east side. Uh, the code uh, would normally require a six-foot masonry wall, and they would like to have a, a three-foot masonry wall. Now, right now, along that entire side is a, is a six-foot chain link fence, again, with barbed wire in some, in some cases. Um, the staff and the Planning Commission felt that the shorter wall actually was compatible because uh, doing the longer wall really, really blocked, the, blocked the site in and uh, we believe for security purposes and also for aesthetics that the openness is, is actually an enhancement on the property. So the staff recommended approval of these deviations to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Planning and Zoning Commission did approve it, uh, but I will note that they shared Mr. Smallage's concerns about the two um, existing stores. So with that, I think if you don't mind, Mayor and Council, I would like to have Circle K come up directly so I don't miscommunicate uh, what their intentions are with those stores and tell you exactly what their plans are for Florence and particularly those two two stores if that would be okay. Before you bring them up uh, on the, the map you have up there now, where is the entrance and exits to the property? Uh, the, the main entrance? Well, yeah. But yeah, the, the main entrance, I would point to it, but I know that wasn't show up on you. So the main, the main entrance, there's two driveways on, on Main Street. There currently, it's almost a continuous open driveway on, on Main Street for the old Foxworth. Uh, ADOT has um, thus far sent their support for the reduction of driveways and the allowance of the two, of the two driveways. And then on the, on the uh, back street, I believe that's Elizabeth, correct? there is a, 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 an additional driveway. So there's two on Main Street and then one on the, on the east frontage. On what? On, a, on Elizabeth. Okay. And Mark, another question for you. Uh, deliveries to the store, where will they be made? In front of the store or off of Beatty Street or where? Well, Mayor and Council, uh, they have the opportunity with this store to actually uh, be able to come onto the property and do everything that they need to do for the function of the gas station and for the convenience store on the property within, with, contained within their parking area. So they do not actually have to do any of their business on, uh, from off the street. Uh, at their existing stores, they're a, little, they're a little bit confined on those two properties. They have the opportunity for loading and unloading on, this, on the property here. And one other thing, uh, trash, where will they be located? Also is a trash container that's located on, on the property, and that is loaded and unloaded from uh, inside the property. And the last thing, fire hydrant placement. Where, are they, where will the fire hydrant placements be? Uh, the fire department is still uh, would still be reviewing this this property, but uh, the, the development of the site, uh, the existing hydrants that are on the property uh, may may be uh, adequate or they may be expanded. But we we have not fully evaluated that. If we do add hydrants, most likely they would be along um, one or more of the street frontages, and those would be in the in the right of way. And they're located in. On the property, uh, Mayor Council, I don't believe that we would locate a, a public hydrant on the property. I believe that they would be located probably along one of the three front frontages. So the, the probability, because I understand we're taking a look at bringing the water line from the tank down, so we'll come from south to north to it. And again, I got to go back to what Jerry said about the parking because all he's got is on st off street or on street parking there. That the fire hydrants, if we go in there and we put in a fire where you can't park, that kind of messes him up also. That's the only reason I was asking those questions because I am concerned, like Jerry said, about that also. Understood. Is there a sidewalks on the uh, north side? And of the property and then on the, uh, well, on the west, east, and north sides of the property? Uh, uh, or Mayor, will there be sidewalks outside the wall? Mayor Council, uh, Council Member Hawkins, uh, absolutely. On all three frontages, there, there, there will be sidewalks. 
There are existing sidewalks uh, uh, along most of the frontage today, um, but those will be evaluated as to whether they're, they're adequate and whether they're, if they are inadequate, they will be uh, modified to some extent. Any existing curb cuts that are no longer utilized will be, will be closed and the sidewalks will be uh, replaced in those areas. Okay. It looks like to me the logical place for a fire hydrant would be uh, on Main Street between the two driveways. Uh, Member Anderson, Mayor and Council, um, there are a couple things into, into play and, um, and one will be evaluating um, the fire department looking at it specifically to identify where their, the best location is for them so that they can access, be able to access the entire site utilizing a particular hydrant. Uh, but I know that also the project that we would like to work on as far as expanding the water services to the, to the property may have an impact on that as well. Yeah, I understand. Uh, you said somebody from Circle K is here? Mayor and Council, absolutely. We have two representatives. I'm not sure which, which one or both, uh, so I'll just go ahead and invite you to come up and introduce yourself. And Don't make him mad, Bill. Big as he is. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm Mike Scarborough with Land Development Consultants in Phoenix. As Mark indicated at the Planning Commission meeting, one of the major issues that was raised was in regards to uh, what will happen with the remaining stores. And as the neighbor to our north indicated, the, the property he shares a boundary with is a leased property. We have a few years remaining on that lease. We do have the right to sublease it. It's our intent to sublease it. But we also are aware of the difficulties to some degree of re-tenanting properties in downtown Florence. We've been made aware of that in multiple conversations with members of the community. So the comment that was made in regards to what are they looking to get from a lease standpoint, I don't know that we're in a position to answer actual dollars, but I can tell you that we're very much aware of what the lease rate needs to be in town, and it's our intent to try to lease that property and have it leased. In regards to the property at uh, Maine and Butte, that property is also a leased property, but we have the ability and are trying to exercise the ability to pull it out from the lease state and actually have the pr opportunity to purchase it. The intent in doing that is twofold. One is we understand that it's kind of main and main for the town. And the intent is not to have a, a, a store that would be uh, sitting there uh, unoccupied. Uh, our ideal situation is that we would uh, vacate the property when the new store were to be open if we were to be approved and remove the tanks, remove the canopy and also try to retenant it. In the same time, we're trying to acquire the property so that we own it in fee. And if we are able to do that, we've made, uh, we've had conversations with uh, planning that if we can't get at least in a certain period of time that we would be willing to go ahead and, and, and raise it. And, and then at least we have a vacant piece of property there versus a, a building that's still trying to be retenanted. We're very much aware of the situation that's taken place in the main, main Street corridor. We're not wanting to be uh, anyone that's adding to that scenario for the town, but we also have been a partner in town for over 40 years. Uh, our first store was open and built here in 1972. So we, are a vested, we have a vested interest in the town. We have a food offering that we would like to expand services we'd like to expand in that store, which is the reason we'd like to build a newer, bigger store. And unfortunately, the two opportunities we own, we have today are least interest. We don't have the ability to, to tie the hands of the people that own them. We can only convey to you what we're willing to do and what we're, we're gonna be able to try to do. Well, that sounds pretty good. Just remember on your leasing, it's not Scottsdale. Yes, sir. Understood. And the, gold, the Lost Dutchman gold mine isn't under your property <laughs> because that's the majority of the problems we have here with absentee landlords in, in Florence is everybody thinks their property is worth a heck of a lot more. And it is worth, if you were in Scottsdale, you could get a lot more. 
put down here as we try to rejuvenate Main Street and everything. To, and I, I appreciate you working towards trying to get them released or whatever you have to do to do that. Uh, but I too worry about, you know, I don't want to see what's going on in the one in Coolidge uh, where you got boarded up windows and other, we got enough fences around here. We don't need another fence on Main Street. Understood. And uh, are you going to raise that building in Coolidge or what are you going to do with that one over there? Uh oh, we got the boss coming up now. Sir. <laughs> Mayor Council, my name is Susie Peel with Circle K. Uh, the site in Coolidge is being marketed for sublease and it's boarded up to protect the asset at this point in time, but we are marketing it and we do have some interest from some parties there. So our intent is not to level that location as it is a lease, but we are looking for a good tenant at this point. And this one down here on Main and Butte, you're not going to resell it to you, Totem? I, I didn't hear your question. Are you going to resell it back to you, Totem? that you bought it from? No. Okay. Thank and if I understand right, you're, you're going to have a stipulation on the property that it won't be in, in a, to a, for a business in competition with you. Is that correct? If we have the ability to control that under a fee situation, if we own the property, that would be correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, they're, they're going to remove the uh, fuel tanks so there wouldn't be another uh, another com com competitor as such i mean because they're they're removing the fuel tanks right correct we will move the fuel tanks and the fuel canopy and all the dispensers and the piping right thank you okay yeah. karen yeah i um i appreciate all of the efforts made to accommodate the closure of those buildings and the reopening of a new building uh, with that, however, I have a question about employees, uh, not related to the planning issue. Um, how many employees are currently with the two facilities, and is there any accommodation being made to place those same individuals in the new facility? The, the total number of employees in the newer environment, larger store, will probably be very similar to the number of employees we have trying to operate two stores. Uh, there's, there's actually the very real likelihood that we may, you may actually see another employee more visible total than we did between the two stores just because of the size of the new facility. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, I don't know, it wasn't brought up, I don't think, but there, you're uh, going a little above and beyond working with us to keep it look uh, blend in with the historic Main Street, you are veneering it with the uh, used red, red brick uh, veneer, which will look a lot like the Brunin Camp and uh, well, a lot of the red brick buildings in town, which I think is great because, you know, a lot of the Circle K's are just flat stucco, you know, and this is going to really enhance the uh, neighborhood in that part of the neighborhood along with the Happy Adobe, which has upgraded that property. I think they'll complement each other really well. John? Well, uh, just one other question about the timing of opening and closing. I, I, I'm assuming that you're going to keep the other stores open until this one gets opened. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Anderson, yes, sir, that would be the intent. Okay, thank you. I know some people here would really have a problem if they couldn't stop and get their drink each morning. Yeah. <laughs> here. I'm talking about our clerk. <laughs> she knows that. Well, and our manager does too. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people depend on Circle K. Appreciate you being here. Any other questions? I have one more. Uh, go kind of goes back to the fire hydrant thing. Um, if um, I understand, we, you know, it's, it's not a cut and dry situation on that. Um, is there going to be a stipulation if, if for some reason we can't get that right amount of pressure over there? Um, is that going to this would be a question for Brent, I would imagine. Uh, 
Mr. Mayor, Council Member Hawkins, we're currently working with the applicant diligently to come up with a solution uh, that benefits uh, Florence, uh, the properties uh, along Main Street, as well as this potential economic de uh, development venture. And from a staff perspective, we're confident that working with the applicant, uh, we're going to be able to uh, meet the requirements of the code. Okay. Looking at your map again, Brent, uh, trying to, the wall is going to go completely around from Brady to down Elizabeth down to Collingwood. Is that correct? I believe Mark should be the right one to answer that question. Mark, is that? Mayor, along Brady, essentially, you have the back side of the building, which is which is serving as a as a, a de facto wall, and then where they have a three foot screen wall, it's really to screen the parking and the headlights of the cars along uh, for the loading the loading area at Brady and Elizabeth, and then along the frontage along Elizabeth, um, along the Collingwood frontage, there actually are um, coming up to the existing development that's there on the property. So there is no wall planned on that side at this on, point. On the Collingwood side, there's no wall there. On the Collingwood side, the the current plan right now shows that the car wash and the water and ice facility and the small building next to the car wash will will continue to be there and they'll be coexisting with those along the frontage, but they are working with those property owners and and folks that are leasing those businesses to see if potentially the site could be expanded down to Collingwood. The Circle K site? Yes. And if they do modify the site plan, the site plan approval by the Planning Commission was conditioned that if it is expanded to go down to Collingwood, that an amendment will be brought back to them for their review. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, what's the uh, timing on this? If if this gets approved, when will it start and when will it finish? Mayor, Mayor, members of the council, Mr. Anderson, I think that the next step really in this venture uh, is going to be the submittal of a design of a uh, development agreement application uh, so that we can work out some of the details of the of the infrastructure project that we've alluded alluded to here. Um, if they would like to, and we feel comfortable at some point proceeding with the review of construction plans at, at risk, uh, we can have that, we can facilitate that discussion as, as well. But I think the first thing we want to do is, much like the next item on the agenda, is start having that discussion about what's going to be in that development agreement and, and working out the details of what the water solution is going to be on the property. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Hear no other. Brent, do you have anything else you need to input in? Okay, then we need a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 1603-16, a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, approving a town court infill incentive plan request related to the proposed development of a new downtown Circle K convenience store and gas station to be located on Pinal County Assessor Parcel Number 202-03-16. 0580. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 1603-16. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I item B, discussion, approval, disapproval of directing staff to commence development negotiations with Simon C.R.E. Beacon Five LLC and other associated parties regarding the proposed development of a medical office building at 174 West Highway 287, Florence, Arizona. Mayor well, and Council members, as as uh, you just heard, thank uh, you, folks. Through the discussion uh, that was just completed uh, regarding the Circle K uh, development, we we face a similar situation uh, regarding. The development proposed by Simon CRE Beacon, which is a healthcare facility, in that uh, we have some infrastructure limitations in terms of water line sizing, uh, and they would have some difficulty without assistance meeting the minimum fire flow requirements uh, as required by our adopted codes uh, in the town of Florence, which are also uh, the international codes. Therefore, Simon Cree. 
uh, Beacon 5 has submitted for Council's review a development agreement application based on our uh, new development agreement standard. And we are here before Council tonight uh, as a staff asking uh, if Council will approve review of that application and our ability to begin negotiation of a development agreement. Uh, of course, that development agreement, once negotiated, would come back to Council for approval, but our new process requires Council to approve of spending staff time to negotiate an agreement uh, with the applicant. I think it's almost a no-brainer. No yeah. Need a motion, unless someone has a question about it. I'll make a motion to direct the staff to commence development <coughs> negotiation with Simon, CRE, Beacon 5, LLC and other associated parties seeking to enter into a DA with the town of Florence in order to facilitate the proposed development of a medical office building in Florence, Arizona. Second. We have a motion and a second direct staff to commence development negotiations with Simcoe Creek, Beacon 5, LLC and other associated parties. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I call the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Short reports. Mr. Mayor, I have a number of items tonight. First, I wanted to recognize Mr. Skip Chase, who's in the audience, as well as his partner, uh, Dennis Lechner, if you, if you guys would stand. Um, it has come to my attention, and I think it's really neat, I would like to bring it to the council and the public's attention, that these, uh, these gentlemen just won the most prestigious award that is provided to Taco Bell franchisees uh, in the world. And it's called the Glenn Bell uh, Award. Uh, in case you didn't know, Glenn Bell is the gentleman who started Taco Bell in, in 1964. It's the largest award that's provided uh, by Taco Bell Corporation. Uh, and they look at a number of things, including how well you maintain your assets, um, the type of assets that are provided and built, in terms of the amenities, uh, and how neat is it that our franchisee uh, in Florence is the winner of the most prestigious award provided by Taco Bell Corporation? I wanted to make sure that uh, they were recognized. They sure ought to be. Well, congratulations. And, uh... Next item I have is to let everybody know of the wonderful things happening in the next few weeks at the Florence Library. The National Novel Writing Month is this month and every Monday evening in November uh, they have various events that are going to be sponsored by the library relating to National Novel Writing Month. So please uh, see Rose, 5.30 to 7.30 I want to say is, is the times when those are offered. Second, kids voting tomorrow, last day. Yay. Good advertisement for everybody else to vote too, but kids voting tomorrow at the library. I know that they're also voting at the school tomorrow, all the schools, so it should, uh, should be a lot of fun. Technology program eBooks and e-readers is being provided Thursday, November 10th at 2 p.m. Adult coloring night, which I just found out from uh, my favorite show, 60 Minutes, is, is a really big thing now uh, in the United States, will be held November 10th from 5 to 8. Uh, we will continue to have early release programs uh, for the kids uh, on early release days. The next one scheduled for November 16th. Coffee Club, the first coffee club will be offered November 17th at 10 a.m. And I believe your keynote speaker that day is me. So <laughs> I think you're advertising it as meet the town manager. So we'll look forward if folks want to come out to Coffee Club 10 a.m. on the 17th. Open Mic Night will be held Friday, November 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. Star Trek and Beyond at the Library will be held Saturday, November 19th at 1 p.m. I, I went to the Star Wars version of that uh, a few months ago and, and with the kids, and it was a great event. And then there's going to be a Thanksgiving break program provided by the library uh, Wednesday, November 23rd all day. So those are the things upcoming at the library. Next announcement, we just found out that Allie, that works for us in our Parks and Recreation Department, 
has been elected to the Southern Region to be the Southern Region Rep for the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association and will be serving a two-year term on that board. So I'm told that that is a very desirable thing and that when was the last time we had somebody on that board? Never? I, and I, ne I next want to read uh, into the record uh, a note that I received. It says, to the Dorothy Nolan Senior Center, this is in memory to my parents, Robert and Evelyn Burns. Thank you for always being so helpful and thoughtful to my parents. They always express their great love and appreciation for Laura, Tanya, and Rhoda. You and the center brought great joy to my parents. Thank you. Uh, and we received a check for $1,000 in donation in, in memory to parents. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to give uh, the fire chief an opportunity to, to say a few words about our participation in the Arizona Run for the Fallen. I sent information uh, to the council with respect to that, but I know that Dave wanted to uh, recognize some folks uh, on TV tonight. So, have at it. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Rankin, uh, members of the council, Four years ago, uh, there, the event was started uh, with the idea of creating a corridor that recognized fallen service members through, uh, that died, uh, that came from Arizona. So it starts down in Tucson, it comes up through Florence, and it goes and ends up at the state capitol. Uh, this event happened a couple of weeks ago, and the idea is that the, there's all the uh, different uh, armed forces are represented. There's a runner that carries a flag for each, and then family members of fallen service members meet these people at each mile marker so that they can acknowledge um, the, the sacrifice, uh, and they hand them an American flag and read information about the, the fallen service member. It's a very powerful event. Uh, again, it's we uh, were providing medical coverage for this event uh, by ourselves, but the police departments, all the law enforcement, every agency switch off. Well, last year we did the same thing. All the fire, I contacted all the other fire departments in, in that corridor, and now we all switch off too, just like law enforcement does. Going into next year, they're going to add fallen first responders, police and fire into this event, starting with the 19 firefighters from Prescott that lost their lives a few years ago. So I just, Florence is a very integral part in helping get this up and running, and it's, a, it's very meaningful to the families, and I'm looking forward to expanding it going forward. And I just want to make sure everyone was aware of that. Dave, I'm going to expand off of that with you. Uh, I was at the dinner that night at the Legion for them when they hit come into town, and there's nothing that'll uh, tear your heart up to sit there and, and uh, hear some mom and dad talk about their son or daughter that has lost their life in service to our country. Uh, it was a, uh, it was, it was a real get you kind of moment to, to meet these people and to see how they're, they're reacting to life afterwards. And the organization that ran, all of the runners were uh, veterans of one form or another, I believe. And uh, they got a little bit later start out of here than they anticipated, but uh, it's a it's a great deal. And uh, you guys being associated with it makes me feel good. Thank you, Mayor. I would just add that they had a, someone not show up this year, called out sick or something, and one of our members, Chris Reagan, uh, was able to step in and fill in for him uh, during that. So we had uh, we have some pictures of him carrying the flags. Great. You done? Okay. Departments, any, anybody have any questions? Any department heads that are here tonight? I'm okay. Okay. Second call to the public. Anybody else in the public have anything you want to talk about? Seeing no movement, I'll close call to the public. Call to the council, John. I uh, would like to thank the police department again for the tip of cop. Uh, event that went on this last Friday. Uh, it was quite successful, as I understand. How much money did you say they raised? Okay. So that was for the Special Olympics, correct? So, 
Thanks again. Becky? Oh, I would just like to thank the HDAC um, uh, committee for inviting me to go to Flagstaff. It was really a great day. I love spending time with the town staff, Gilbert and Will, uh, getting to know especially Will a little bit better, of course reminiscing with Gilbert, but also with the members of the HDAC committee and of um, planning and zoning committee. Uh, we had a great day. I got to know these people a lot better on a personal level and really had an enjoyable day. Plus loving to see the award given to the town of Florence. The second item I have is I'd like to thank the Parks and Rec Department, um, Brian, for the uh, inviting the Santa Cruz um, Club down to do the uh, presentation at Padilla Park for the mariachis. It was just wonderful. Those high school kids just really played their heart out and they were actually very good. But sometime in the future, I would like to see a festival with uh, adult mariachis coming into the area at a, at a uh, time where we can get the communities together to participate in a uh, real nice event, and also bluegrass. I've mentioned it several times before. I know they're costly uh, organizations to bring down, but they make so much of a difference to the kind of programs that you give. But that Santa Cruz was just so enjoyable, and actually there were a lot of folks that turned out for that, and it was at between 11 and 2 in the afternoon, which was great. So thank you so much. It was a little bit warm, too. Yeah. <laughs> Bill? Well, I'd like to uh, point out the, the great response, uh, quick response and professionalism when there was the uh, two power lines or power poles got pulled down uh, behind the American Legion. Uh, fire, police, and public works were on the scene and within minutes, I mean, and had it under control and did a really great job. And then also, I'd like to thank staff on where we're at on the Main Street improvements. It, I've been getting a lot of compliments from uh, citizens that have, are really happy now that they've seen those other, I think there's two big lights left up, but but it really has cleaned up the uh, the view on Main Street when you're coming down it. And it's actually a little brighter at night uh, with those new lights. If anybody's been out at night down Main Street and noticed, but anyway, that's thank you, staff. Karen, I just want to say how impressed I am with all of the various programs that are held within our town. Um, hearing about what's going on at the library, what Parks and Recreation is doing, fire, police, um, and all of the other staff departments that are so active. And I just want to keep encouraging more and more people to turn out for those from all of our communities, uh, north, south, and, and west. So uh, thanks to all of you for the hard work that you're putting in. Larry? I actually don't have anything tonight. Chair? Not to ditto anything that was already previously said, but to add to it, we recently had the Pony Express come to Town Hall to deliver and um, stamp some mail that residents brought forward. Allie did a great job of communicating with the K-8 schools and getting some letters from the students as well. I look forward to expanding upon that program in the future. It was a great event. And also tomorrow is election day, so hopefully everybody comes out in the community and then for once and for all we can take down the signs that are all up and down the highways and we can move forward. Last thing, Brian, Halloween was a trick and a treat. It was neat. The last count I saw was 1,254 people come through the gate. What was it? Do you know what the final to total was? Uh, Mayor, I think it was maybe 20, 25 more than that, but we were close to 1,300 total. The, uh, I had two people come up to me after the parade. They, they drove downtown, uh, or one person, excuse me. He drove downtown. He lives on Phoenix Street. He had been at his house for, since 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 
until eight o'clock and not one trick-or-treater had come by. So he came down here and was giving candy away to any kid that had come along. He had all this candy and he didn't, he couldn't eat it. So he was giving candy away. The, the, we did have a lot of trick-or-treaters out in the Anthem area. I know that for a fact. Uh, we did have some here in town too. But the party that you put on down there is doing great. And it just seems like it gets a little bigger. I was noticing the parking lot. You know, we have it much bigger. We're going to have to build another parking lot. <laughs> but the, uh, and to all the people that donated to the trunk or treat for the elementary, the K through eight, we really appreciate that too. Some people forgot about it. <clears throat> I'm not going to mention any names. Two of them are sitting here. But uh, the, uh, it, it was a great deal. And I think it's, it's kept our crime rate. I, don't, I didn't hear of too many bad things that happened over Halloween. And uh, that is always a good thing. And as Tara said, the election is tomorrow. Uh, no matter if you vote for her or me, whatever you do is go out and vote. It's the most important right that you have. And you need to exercise it each and every time. So with that, we need a motion. Make a motion to adjourn to executive session. Second. We have a motion and a second to direct it to, to what? Going to executive session. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Most carries. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going into executive session. We will come back in to, uh, to close the meeting. <laughs>